We get a pretty good shot of Aang's right side here as he wakes up with no staff in sight, but when this bomb is launched at him and he reacts, it seems like he has it right there on hand. Normally, Aang's staff has two thicker portions where the glider is stored, one longer and one shorter, but in this one quick shot, it looks like he's got more of a Darth Maul setup going. Whoa, that's pretty cool. Seems like you might have wanted to use that function instead of just running around the corner when Combustion Man was attacking, though. Also, speaking of that Combustion Man attack, remember when Toph said, He's going to blast this whole place right off the cliffside! I think it would have been a pretty cool action scene if this explosive attack did actually end up blowing this platform off the cliffside, as a subtle little callback. I mean, I guess it gets pretty close. Watch out! Holy shit, that's a crazy flying spear tackle. How is Katara just okay after this? That'd put me on my ass for weeks. Also, where the fuck were you on that one, Toph? Sokka doesn't thank you that one time and then suddenly falling rocks are on the menu for all of Team Avatar? Aw, oh, not the Sky Bison mural, bro. Wait, so these are steel flaps that are just crumbling like that? Like just utterly fractured and destroyed? Do these bombs have that kind of explosive yield? I don't know, I guess I'm no fucking bomb doctor. What are you doing here? You mean it's not obvious yet? I am about to celebrate becoming an only child! Ah yes, the extremely expedited complete mental collapse of Azula. That is, for some reason, so revered amongst the fanbase. Uh, we'll get into this in the finale. Wait, did you just see that move she just did? I know I said Aang had mad core strength, but she literally stopped all forward momentum with this flip and also had enough power to launch herself backwards. Azula has to be doing sit-ups at all times when she's not on screen. Here's number three on the list of Zuko's insane jumps. Look at the distance he gets. Can he jump like this in a not life or death context? Is Zuko just capable of leaping 30 feet? It's also a really weird beat to have Zuko go for this jump and then he just kind of doesn't make it. It's like, oh, that was kind of lame actually. I can't get him to go in there. Tunnels. It's another reference to the love cave. No! The Fire Nation can't separate our family again. It'll be okay. It's not forever. Once again, more subtle tears. We can see Katara well up here as she accepts the situation. Okay, B-Team and Dad and Chit Sang, you guys go down this vague tunnel. It's imperative that we split up here because honestly, the writers don't have anything for you guys to do. Suki, you can come though. You're cool. Wait, where's Momo? Where's Momo been this whole time? You can't leave without Momo. No! Oh, wait, no, no. He's here. Never mind. Hello? Zuko here. I bet I could fucking make it this time. Yeah, this is just another ridiculous leap. Like, this is crazy. There's a subtle detail here that kind of leans towards Zuko being really powerful now. We see Zuko only goes rolling off his side of the Zeppelin, right? And he was closer to its edge than Azula was. But it seems like when Azula gets launched back, she goes flying and kind of like skips off the top of it. Like she got blown back way harder. She's not gonna make it. Azula actually uses her hairpin here to stick into this rock face to catch herself, which is why her hair is down all of a sudden. You can actually see her take it out of her hair too in a split second motion. Whoa, we're back at good moon continuity. Here we have a nearly full moon, and on the next night in this same episode, it's a full moon. What ruins it is that it was absolutely a full moon last episode too, which is like, come on, we're so close to having it work. Wow, camping. It really seems like old times again, doesn't it? Yeah, where do you get all this camping gear? You have four tents? You've never had four tents in your entire journey. You really want to know? Hmm, maybe you could reconquer Ba Sing Se in the name of the Earth King. Or, I know, you could bring my mother back. Oh shit, I never noticed Katara actually gave him the old purposeful shoulder into shoulder walk by I'm mad at you maneuver. Is there a name for that move? Oops. Wrong tent. Oh, she was going into the wrong tent. Ah, it's funny because it's the wrong tent. Classic Suki. Well, hello. <laughs> You can actually see Zuko's face more from the cartoon reaction to his normal face right here, which is strangely more alarming for some reason. Wait, so is this an Earth tent? Because the inner walls would have me believe that, but the outside shot makes it look like a normal tent. So what's on your mind? Your sister. She hates me. And I don't know why. What do you mean? She fucking told you, dude. Ugh, men are impossible. It's not a day I like to remember. Wait, hold on. By the looks of this flashback, the Southern Water Tribe used to be way more well put together. What caused it to degrade to this awful little circle of tents that we saw at the start of the show? There probably weren't any more Fire Nation attacks after this one since there was no more waterbenders to hunt, and this raid goes pretty quick, so there's probably not a lot of damage done right now. So it seems weird that only a handful of years later they're down to looking like this. These guys have unique uniforms. Is this like a special operations unit for just capturing waterbenders? They're literally called the Southern Raiders, but there also seemingly hasn't been a raid on the South for 50 plus years at this point if Hama is to be believed but Hama was also clearly not secured by people in these uniforms. That would have been a nice touch if they were wearing these uniforms in Hama's flashback. But anyway, why the sick threads? Sea Ravens. The main ship had flags with Sea Ravens on them. 
the Southern Raiders. They're infamous for their southerly based rating. I should have known. Okay, what the fuck is going on with this tent? Why is there a flap here if there's no back wall? Also, I do not trust the angle of this earth slab. I would not be sleeping under that. Here's a behind the scenes joke I know. So for just a moment here, we see Sokka fiddling with his flower necklace, which seems weird. But the joke is that a certain kind of flower necklace in Hawaii is called a lei, L-E-I. And Sokka is seen here making one because he got laid last night. That is a really hard joke to get, but why else are you watching this channel, I guess? I need to borrow Appa. Why? Is it your turn to take a little field trip with Zuko? Yes. Okay, that's the one lampshade you get to hang on the way you chose to write these penultimate episodes. I hope you don't do it again. Ah, oh, they're gonna do it again, aren't they? We're going to find the man who took my mother from me. Sokka told me the story of what happened. I know who did it and I know how to find him. I am in love with this scene. This is so genuinely and meaningfully mature for a kid's show. Just this conversation is the highlight of the entire episode for me. Katara has obviously been hurting for the whole show about her mother dying, and when she's met with this opportunity for revenge, she very understandably goes to a dark place. So her being this way is very natural. But then the other three characters in this conversation are so terribly in character at Hurst as well. Zuko wants to get into Katara's good graces, but also this is something he would genuinely see as just and a good thing to do. And meanwhile, Aang preaches forgiveness and even brings up things he's had to deal with. You're feeling unbelievable pain and rage. How do you think I felt about the sandbenders when they stole Appa? How do you think I felt about the Fire Nation when I found out what happened to my people? He's trying to help Katara in the same way that she helped him when he couldn't sleep. And Sokka, who has dealt with his mother's passing in his own way and has probably handled it in a healthier way than Katara, agrees with Aang and just wants to let it go. But I think Aang might be right. Then you didn't love her the way I did. And with this line, Katara is obviously just acting out. She's in a very compromised emotional state at the moment. But this also does play back into her overhearing Sokka saying he doesn't remember his mother's face, which, I mean, could be jarring to hear from your sibling. You definitely have some thoughts on that, even if he was complimenting you as he said it. This conversation is just so juicy. So many differing viewpoints, and we can see where they're all coming from so clearly. And it's easy to agree that they all have a point. The one thing I don't like is that Aang tries to deliver this in-universe proverb. The monks used to say that revenge is like a two-headed rat Viper. While you watch your enemy go down, you're being poisoned yourself. And the proverb is fine, I just think it doesn't serve such a real and heavy conversation very well to bring up a two-headed rat viper. But it finds its way again really quickly with the best line out of the whole conversation. You do have a choice. Forgiveness. That's the same as doing nothing. No, it's not. It's easy to do nothing. But it's hard to forgive. Jesus, what a line out of Aang. I'm just riveted whenever I watch this back and forth. This is a perfect dramatic conversation. Katara, you sound like Jet. All right, now that I'm done gushing, do you guys think that Zuko's standing there and he hears Jet get brought up and he's just like, wait, you guys knew Jet? Also, there's a full Earth tent in this shot that we've never seen before and it's not there when we come back at night in the next shot. You need to face this man, but when you do, please don't choose revenge. Let your anger out and then let it go. That's a very interesting and thoughtful take from Aang. It's not just don't do it, it's if you're going to do it, I hope you do it the right way. Which is once again a really cool and mature take. You know, you're pretty wise for a kid. Thanks, Sokka. Usually it's annoying, but right now I'm just impressed. Has Aang been all that wise before this episode? Can I borrow Momo for a week? Momo's actually been noticeably absent in this episode. He's only been in that one shot. He's usually kicking around in the background somewhere, but not even during the campfire scene. Weird. Okay, so canonically, if it's supposed to be a full moon each month, they probably want us to believe that this is the full moon after the whole Hama debacle. But as you know, we have soundly debunked that. Where'd you guys get these ninja outfits from? Ink bending is the rarest form of bending. Do not talk to me ever again. This lady bears a striking resemblance to a higher up we saw go out to attack the water tribe boats on the day of Black Sun. Bam. On patrol near Whale Tail Island. This is the second time we hear about Whale Tail Island. Last time was when the Dai Li tried to trick the gang into going there while looking for Appa. Foreman said some rich royal type on Whale Tail Island bought him up. Don't you worry about my strength. I have plenty. I'm not the helpless little girl I was when they came. What I really like about this storytelling device is that we're actually being told the same story three separate times, just from the different perspectives of the people telling it. I like that a lot. There's this kid here that seems to be around the same age as Sokka, a little younger if anything. So where was this kid back when we were in the South Pole? If he was younger than Sokka, he wouldn't have left for the war. But Sokka was also clearly the oldest male in the tribe by a pretty wide margin. When Katara started telling her story, the sun wasn't totally over the horizon yet. But now, as she finishes it, it's up in the sky a little ways. That's a nice touch. When we got there, the man was gone. And so is she. Katara phrases this strangely. She says it as if her mother could have been taken prisoner. But we've been told over and over again in the show her mother was killed. I think it's so there's a reveal later on in the episode that hard confirms she's dead again. But it's a really weird writing choice to bring Katara's mom's living or dead status back into question, even vaguely. Dad! Dad! Please! I think mom's in trouble! There's a man in our house! 
Also, if you think about this series of events, Katara totally just bust into that igloo and saw her mom's charred corpse, which is pretty chilling. Man, what was I talking about when I said Katara doesn't really do anything on this level again? Maybe I was thinking while well, she's not boosted by the full moon? I don't know, bad point past me. Zuko actually disarms this guy and delivers his hip check in one swift motion. But it leaves me to wonder, it's weird that Zuko didn't bring his own swords on this mission, right? I think making this guy look so similar in only this one shot to Yon Ron Katara's flashback is kinda cheap, honestly. He doesn't bear much of a resemblance to him at all outside this shot, so I think it could've been cool for eagle-eyed viewers to notice that they don't look alike and put it together for themselves. So Katara using bloodbending here is a cool storytelling moment. It's a device that's been framed to be totally outside of her moral beliefs. So to see her use it here really puts an exclamation point on the feelings we've seen her get across. But is it just me or does this kind of feel like the writers wrote this scene in just to have bloodbending come back briefly? So Hama's episode didn't feel so isolated. Like it would have been weird if bloodbending happened literally only once, right? So doing it here makes it feel like it's more of a real thing. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It might actually even be a good thing, but I think it's just noticeable after how many times I've watched the show, I guess. I need something. Yes, mother. What is it? The tomato carrots from your garden are too hard for my gums. This is a very weird thing to introduce on episode 56 of a 61 episode show. Tomato carrots? As in the same way animals are spliced together in this show? Why haven't we heard anything like this before? Would you like something else from the garden? You don't got anything going on in the garden, yon Ra. Shit looks like a town Clint Eastwood would ride into. Hello? Is someone there? That was him. That was the monster. I can tell by the way he said, Hello? Is someone there? Nobody sneaks up on me without getting burned. We weren't behind the bush. Whoever you are, take my money. Take whatever you want. I'll cooperate. So yon Ra being this little pathetic loser is a really interesting way to take this conflict, actually. There hasn't been an Avatar villain that's been built up to such an extent that's been a false climax. Shit, Long Feng was a big problem and we didn't even know he was a bender until he turned Jet's internal organs into hamburger meat. So this obviously terrible man who's done ghastly, unforgivable things just turning out to be this cowering, frightened old man is a really novel concept. I like that they chose to juxtapose this vision of the ultimate villain in Katara's head with him actually being a sniveling, sad old man. Why don't you take a closer look? Yes, yes, I remember you now. You're the little water tribe girl. I can tell by the way you said- Why don't you take a closer look? Once again, we're met with a new angle of the story because now it's from Yon Ra's perspective. I just think that's really cool. Okay, so here we go with the Hama theory. So Hama was taken from this water tribe around 50 years ago, and she actually turned out to be this crazy next level bloodbending witch. Up to and including Hama, the waterbenders were only ever taken prisoner and thrown into jail. But now, on this first anti-waterbending raid in half a century, with the context of waterbenders from this tribe somehow being able to brutally control people and escape prison, the Fire Nation are not taking prisoners on this raid, most likely because they don't want a repeat of Hama. So basically, the idea of Hama got Katara's mom killed. Woo! I could have redirected that. So Katara not killing Yon Ra and just getting a few digs in here feels weirdly climactic for such an anti-climax. I think it's because it's an emotional climax for Katara, or maybe just an emotional hurdle that she's gotten past. Like, this episode hasn't really had the feeling of building up to a crazy fight at all. It's felt like Katara acting out and trying to find some semblance of closure, whether that be revenge or forgiveness. So I feel like that's why this works. But as much as I hate you, I just can't do it. You want me to do it? We actually rejoined the gang on Ember Island here, just down the hill from the Ozai family house. I wanted to take out all my anger at him, but I couldn't. I don't know if it's because I'm too weak to do it, or if it's because I'm strong enough not to. And I really like that Katara doesn't actually reach a conclusion on her feelings about yon -Ra. She's still furious and hate-filled because of course you would be. That dude killed your mom. It would have felt really weird if she just straight up forgave him. And I feel like a lot of kids shows would have gone down that route. This episode takes a really nuanced look at the situation, and I'm really glad that Katara is only on the road to having a better outlook on it by the end of it. It feels really real. Violence wasn't the answer. It never is. Then I have a question for you. What are you going to do when you face my father? 
This episode is obviously awesome. This might be the episode with the most adult tones in the entire run. Once Katara and Zuko go on their mission, there's no joking around. It takes itself very seriously, and I think it shines for that. I just said the show takes a nuanced look at this situation a minute ago, and I hate to repeat myself, but that is the best way to describe it. The characters all have unique and valid views on this really heavy topic, and that one scene, like I said, is amazing. Easily a top five scene in the show for me. And by the end of it, Katara's just in this state of anger and confusion, and she's questioning her own morality and what's right and what isn't. It's just very gray and adult and so viscously real. And there's no really good answer. Not to crawl on my own skin here or anything, but I don't think I'd be able to stop myself in that situation. I don't know if a lot of people could. And for someone that's been so sure of her own moral compass throughout the entire show to be met with this question of she's not sure whether she should have done it or not is endlessly interesting. This episode poses a question to Katara and the viewer, and by the end of it, the question is unanswered for Katara, and maybe it is for the viewer too. And wow, what a great choice to have it end on that note. Patron shoutouts, if you want to be two episodes ahead of the YouTube releases, you can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. Biggest shoutouts of all go to my top patrons, Ajit Rhino, who can actually float when they meditate, Ben Misera, who chopped down a redwood with three mighty kicks, Brendan Murphy, who could have drawn Excalibur from the stone if he got the goddamn chance, Donnie Snow, who had a 2x4 broken over his head and he actually gained 5 IQ points, Dylan Calvo, who gains the power of the witch at the stroke of midnight, Dylan Roche, whose birth caused the Tunguska event, Garrett Kane, who discovered the color purple, Honor and Cultivation, Grappling Hook World Champion, Jerry Kraft, the first person to perform a 900 on a skateboard with no half pipe, Caitlin, who snuck into the hexagon, which is roughly 15% more secure than the Pentagon, Kennedy Stapleton, who has a gold medal in turtle spinning, whatever that is, Leif Earn Hammer, who outran the eruption at Pompeii on a motorcycle, Lou Carrera, who threw a frisbee so hard the atmosphere made it ignite, Mandatory Sin, who has the mental capacity of one human plus one dolphin, Nick Kapanen, who slew the one and only known Sky Squid, Omega Fighter, who has a Volkswagen Beetle that can travel interdimensionally, RCNFL, who can flashbang you by clapping their hands, Skylos, who has the other half of the amulet, you need that amulet, Sky Strider, whose shadow can kill other shadows, Stephanie Riches, who has entered screaming neon mode, Tiago Nascimento, who has been uploaded to the internet and has a digital clone that he's not totally aware of yet, Varuna, who can do that cool backflip dismount off the swing set that you've never had the balls to try, and Zumpy, who doesn't need a swinter mom, it's not even cold, and of course my other fuck you money patrons, Burb, Caesar's Ghost, Charlie Rock Quigley, Danger Stranger, Daniel Ward, Emperor Tromedlov Droma, Eric Barney, etc, Finnish Blood, Fritz Sullivan, Harrison Poland, Jared Berkman, John, Mage the Mage, Misha Boblov, Nopetron, Pran of Prem, Sean Martin, Soup Cube, Sulpitius, The Alternus, The Sinking Bubble, and You Freaking Nerd, and of course my god overanalyzers, Alex Fritz, Alan Garvin, Ali QPZM, Andrew Watrit, Austin Gallup, Be My Valentine, Big Thirsty, Brando Espinosa, Brand Muffin, Cameron O'Solo, K9 Corpse, Charles Barnett, Dan Bertel, David Carlisle, DJ Jax, Do Mutual Aid, Dominic Saint, Distant, Earth 2 John, Eleanor Rose, Fingal Kern, Isaiah Wilson, It's Curtain, Jacob Fries, Jacob White Cotton, Jake the Garden Rake, James Hanlon, Jay Lambo, Jeremy Rubenstein, Jimbo, John Ajaka, Jot Moreland, Joshua Bone, Justin Scott, Kate and Connor Prendergast, Keon Gilliland, Lady Serena, Lehman Russ, Literal NASA Rocket Scientist, Madison McCone, Matthew Stargell, Mitchell Gobrecht, Mortius 007, Nickel Pickle 582, Nicholas Abbott, Omar, Papa Jaka, Papa Parker, G -G -G Gas, Radiator Rat, Riley Booth, Rocket Mist, Shadow Fox Nero, Sky Not Darkened, Sophie Kitty, Spory, Stein One, Super Sniffer, Travis Chestnut, Triad Juiced, Vivina Lockfire, Wilbur, Bass Boosted, Wolfman Dan, Wool, Wyatt Pence, and Zowers. Next up is the Ember Island Players, and I'm not gonna lie, that's gonna be a hard one to do.